Giuseppe di Lambusco's The Leopard is the story about the decline and fall, the extinction, really, of a family, but also the extinction of a way of life. The setting for the book is revolutionary Italy. Italy, as it sits on the cusp of entering into the modern world as a full-fledged nation-state. From the decline of the Roman Empire until just before 1860, Italy was a patchwork of principalities, states, and cities. This patchwork was the topic of Machiavelli's Prince, written in the early 1500s. In the Prince, Machiavelli claims, among other things, that the Church used its spiritual authority among believers to keep the Italian principalities warring against one another. A divided Italy was good for the Church's temporal power, and for its spiritual authority. It was just as true that the divided Italy kept the church relatively weak. Families fought over the papacy, executing one another before the papacy became too powerful. So there was a symbiotic weakness in, the, in Italy, the church keeping the state weak, the little principalities keeping the church weak. The last chapter of Machiavelli's Prince is entitled An Exhortation to Free Italy from the Barbarians. In that chapter, Machiavelli asks someone, perhaps Lorenzo, the Prince of Florence, to whom the Prince uh, is addressed, but probably someone else and someone greater. He asks someone, that is, to put an end to the Church's reign and to unite Italy so it can become a single nation. Other nations had united themselves during Machiavelli's lifetime. Spain had become one after Ferdinand and Isabella consolidated various principalities in Spain before 1500. France had taken decisive steps toward becoming one under Louis XII around 1500. Britain had consolidated power under Henry VII in, uh, in the, the part just before 1500. It was time for Italy to step up, Machiavelli thought and become a modern nation-state, too. The promise is that through a modern nation-state, Italy could embrace the goals of democracy, such as the advances in technology, establish a representative form of government, emancipate women, and achieve greater material comfort. The setting of Lampedusa's leopard is the moment when Italy becomes mostly one and hence sits on the cusp of entering the modern world. It is the moment when the old regime, where life is centered on the church, passes and the new budding regime appears. Lampedusa wrote this book in the 1950s, after the consolidation of Italy was well accomplished, to say the least. He might have presumed that most of his readers knew the history. And just in case many of my listeners have forgotten the history of Italian unification in the 1860s and 70s, I will provide a short history here, since it is the backdrop of the leopard. Remember, however, the big picture, that the leopard is the working out of Machiavelli's dreams of a united Italy. It marks the triumph of modernity and the triumph of Machiavelli, but alas, I do not need to repeat myself. It is not how clear how far we should go back in telling this tale. Perhaps only as far as Napoleon, the infamous French dictator and leader of the late 1700s and early 1800s. We all remember that Napoleon made his reputation as a general in the battles against Austria in northern Italy. The kingdoms of northern Italy were under Austrian control at that time, and Napoleon's great victory was accomplished at Toulon in Sardinia in northern Italy. Much consolidation took place under Napoleon, but even after him, Italy remained divided. The main division was between the more modern north, where Napoleon imposed a species of modernizing code and the South, especially Sicily and Naples, where the spirit of independence and close extended families remained united against the spirit of modern ways. In the South, family came above or before individual freedom. 
In the North, the spirit of individual freedom came to be equal to and eventually greater than family. Remember the mob movies of American lore, The Godfather, for instance. They contained families that come from Sicily, from the South. They come from Sicily after the unification of Italy, and they left Italy as a form of protest against the modernizing tendencies there. It was out of the frying pan and into the fire of modernity for those families. But back to the story. After Napoleon leaves, Italy was consolidated, but it wasn't one. The Kingdom of Two Sicilies was organized under Ferdinand II, who died in 1825. It was a unification of Naples and Sicily. Northern Italy, under the direction of King Victor Emmanuel of Piedmont and his Prime Minister Corvar, the Bismarck of Italy, and with the military leadership of the famed Giuseppe Garibaldi. Northern Italy, that is, saw the backward ways of the Kingdom of Two Sicilies as the obstacle to Italian unification. Garibaldi, the military leader, was the loose cannon of Italian unification, acting faster than Covar and Victor Emmanuel wanted him to, often. Everywhere that Garibaldi invaded, he stepped on the toes of someone, sometimes foreign states, other times local kings. Garibaldi was more Republican than either Covar or Victor Emmanuel. He wanted Italy to go right from the quasi-feudalism of its old arrangement to modern republicanism. Corvoir and Victor Emmanuel saw the need to consolidate Italy under a monarchy. But Garibaldi's success was undeniable. He triumphantly took Sicily in a short battle. He crossed over the sea and took Naples in 1860, just as America was beginning its civil war. And there he declared Victor Emmanuel king of Italy. Plebiscites followed. Sicilians in Naples voted in droves to join the new nation and accept the northerner, practically a non-Italian, as the king of Italy, as their king. At this stage of the game, Garibaldi retired, a la George Washington, and Victor Emmanuel ascended to the throne. To this day, there is a huge monument to Victor Emmanuel in Rome, on the northernmost Capitoline Hill. Many Roman buildings were destroyed and Roman ruins displaced to make room for that monument. Garibaldi came out of retirement, however, to lead one last charge, to attempt to bring Rome itself, Vatican City, under the power of the Italian monarch. This was an action taken out of doors, without the support or knowledge, it seemed, of Victor Emmanuel. The rest of Europe was concerned to see the independence of the Vatican respected, and they arrayed against Garibaldi. Garibaldi lost in Rome in 1870. And this brought the revolutionary stage of Italian independence to an end. The Leopard is framed by these great political events. The book begins, as the chapter subtitles tell us, in May 1860. This is immediately after Garibaldi had invaded Sicily and successfully begun his expedition with his famous red shirts. We see a dead soldier who had fought on behalf of the King of Two Sicilies in a field in this first chapter. There are also pointed flashbacks to Prince Fabrizio, the book's main character, and his meetings with the kings of Two Sicilies. They were not impressive figures. Chapter 2 is set in Donna Fugata, the rural estate of the Fabrizio. Garibaldi has succeeded at this point in capturing the island of Sicily. There is a new mayor to mark the change of regime. And this new mayor's family will play a prominent role in the plot of the book. A plebiscite is referred to in Chapter 3. The kingdom including the prince Don Fabrizio, unanimously agrees to join the new Italy. Unanimously. Perhaps the election was rigged. In any event, this is accomplished in October 1860. 
The Piedmontese, the new men of the new Italy, appear in chapter 4, set only a month later, in November 1860. The church is defanged in chapter 5, set in February 1861. There is a ball in chapter 6, set in November 1862, where we see the prince reflect upon the new order of things in all its gloomy maturity, or so it seems. Thus ends the revolutionary period of the book. The last two chapters work out the logic of the first six. Chapter 7, set in 1883, and the prince dies in that chapter. Chapter 8, set in 1911, we see his daughters as spinsters, and elderly at that. They don't die, but they are relics. There is no place for this family in the modern world. So the leopard concerns the great theme of the old meeting the new, of the pre-modern mores, politics, and religion giving way to modern ways. The evaluation of the book is sympathetic to the virtues of the old way. It recognizes the old way's virtues and takes its claims on the human heart seriously. It is also somewhat negative on the new order of things, recognizing its limits and its distortions of human feeling. This may come from its author, Giuseppe di Lamedusa, who was himself a remnant of the old order, a relic. Born in 1896, he died in 1957. Lampedusa was the son of aristocracy, of a marriage between a prince and a princess. He seems to have modeled the leopard after his grandfather. At least that is what is said. Lampedusa married late, at the age of 36. He married a German woman and a student of psychoanalysis. He married a modern woman. They had no children. When Lampedusa died, so did his family. He was the last of a long line, a relic. He definitely knew that, that that was his fate when he finished The Leopard in 1956. In fact, soon after finishing the book, he died. Even the novel was published posthumously. This is all to say that Lampedusa understood the phenomena that he treats of in The Leopard. He lived them. He saw the world wars. He saw the advent of modernity. He understood the world that modernity had eclipsed. He lived that eclipse. The Leopard fits in in literature with other books that sympathetically treat the passing of aristocracy, including Willa Cather's A Lost Lady, Mark Twain's Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court, Alexander Solzhenitsyn's August 1914, and really his whole Red Wheel series. The Leopard fits in with Tocqueville's Democracy in America, too. The Leopard should be considered a great work of comparative politics that allows us to see the limits of our age better through a sympathetic treatment of another age. We begin our treatment of the leopard in the next video.